You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello and good evening to everyone out there listening to WCATradio.com. My name is Robert Madrigal, the host of this show, Know Your Faith, a forum for those who know the faith, a source for those who like to get to know the faith, a.k.a. Unapologetically Apologetics. On this show, we talk about Catholic apologetics, and we are unapologetic about our love for God, our love for Christ, and our love for the Catholic Church. So tonight, I would like to talk about the reasons why we could believe in heaven and why we believe in the human soul. Now, can anyone answer that question, you know, why we believe in heaven and why we believe in the human soul? I mean, those are things that we cannot see and we cannot prove. So some might say that there's no reason to believe in either one. That's what the atheists will tell us anyway. And some people say that Catholics believe in God because our parents told us to do so. And most of the time, they're right. But there's an upside to that situation, and it is that it is quite enough when we simply believe. Blessed are those who do not see yet believed, uh, John twenty twenty nine, And um, you might be asking yourself, in that case, why would I make it a topic of this show, right? Well, tonight it seems as though I'm saying we believe through faith alone. And usually I say that we have reasons to believe. Well, there are things we believe through faith alone, and there are things that we believe through a reasonable faith Well, I think that we can say that it is reasonable to believe in both heaven and the human soul. Tonight's show is my own explanation of why I say that. The reasons that I talk about tonight won't be found in the Catholic Catechism. However, they are a good apologia to base an explanation on an explanation why we believe in heaven and why we believe in the human soul. But before we get into that, let's start the show off right, and that would be with a prayer. Begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in great thanksgiving today for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we may learn more about our faith for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you will grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity and to see challenges to our faith as a chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we meet and to do this through the example of self-sacrifice that Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. And we ask this in the glorious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So we'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so why do we believe? Why do Christians believe in heaven? And I know why, I know what uh, most everyone listening out there might be thinking right now. Well, it's very simple because of our faith, right? Or some of us might be thinking because The belief in heaven is a Christian doctrine. Well, the real reason why I ask that question is so that we would be able to explain our beliefs to an atheist, if we could answer that question. So, how about a friend who you know is Catholic and falls into doubt about the existence of God and of heaven and the human soul? Well, it gets a bit more complicated to explain why we believe uh, in heaven to someone who's in doubt or someone who doesn't even believe in God. A few years ago, while I was living in Albuquerque, I used to debate this guy who claimed to be an atheist in this chat room I used to uh, visit. Now, the rest of the people in the chat room used to discuss politics. It was a political chat room, and for the most part, It was a conservative um, political chat room. 
And this guy was like a monkey wrench in the system, so to speak, and he would always get online, and it seemed as though all he wanted to do was harass everyone else in the room. And one day he posted that once a person dies, that their energies just dissipate into the universe. And uh, he also said that if anyone thinks they know what happens to a person after they die, he is quote-unquote a dummy. But actually, I'm being nice. He used two words to describe uh, the person's state of mind that he's talking about, and I'll let you use your imagination on that one. I answered back, if you state that you know that our energies dis dissipate into the universe, then that means that you claim to know what happens once we die, and you just called yourself a dummy. Well, in my experience, that little anecdote of mine is a perfect example of what we face when we debate atheists. I've run into a situation a dozen times or more where an atheist will make, an, make an, um, a statement yet exempt themselves from the rules of their statement without even realizing it. And I'll give you another example. I was watching a television debate, and a woman in the debate stated, I don't have faith because I'm not a complete idiot. Well, if I were in that debate, I would have answered her, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. It takes a lot more faith to say that there is no God than the faith it takes to believe that God exists. Now, faith is a belief in something that we cannot prove and we choose to believe anyway. So to state definitively that there is no God, she took a great leap of faith in my view. And I would conclude that the only reason why she made that statement was to make us theists feel like idiots. Um, basically, she was trying to say that the belief in God is idiotic. But then again, maybe she really didn't know the meaning of the word faith. Um, but therein lays the problem. For the most part, when we debate an atheist over the existence of God or the existence of heaven, in my experience, we will always end up being mocked for our beliefs. It's happened to me every time I've run into an atheist. So tonight I would like to suggest an approach which would help us avoid a sound mocking of our beliefs. I mean, even after an opponent mocks our beliefs and walks away victorious in their mind, we will not have to have their victory lead us away from the church and into atheism. If we just um, learn about the reasonability of our beliefs. And when presenting an apologia for the existence of heaven and the human soul to an atheist, we must use reason and reason alone. We can't use the Bible, as they put no stock in the Bible. We can't use historical accounts of Jesus Christ, as they do not believe in God, much less the only, begot um, <clears throat> excuse me, the only begotten Son of God. We can't go by faith alone, because their faith is against the existence of God. So we must show how reasonable it is to believe in God, because the atheists work very hard to show how unreasonable our beliefs are. <clears throat> or to prove how unreasonable they are, anyway. Um, well, I've come up with a rational argument that most likely won't convince an atheist. But as we would be hard-pressed to convince an atheist about any of our beliefs. But it might help an atheist understand that the belief in heaven and, and the human soul is reasonable. That's the whole point. It's not just something that the Catholic Church teaches without any reasonable thought behind it. <clears throat> so let's start with the existence, or the belief in the existence of the human soul. Now I, like most Christians, believe that it is the soul that goes to heaven. We believe that there's a union between the body and soul here on earth. 
But when we die, the body and soul separate and the soul goes to heaven or hell. Now this is a reasonable belief because we obviously have something keeping us alive which is not present after we die. And some might call this a life force, but we Christians call it the soul. Also, think about this. It is far from unreasonable to think that each individual person is born with an individual soul. Excuse me. Um, Each individual soul carries on in existence after the body that the soul is attached to is no longer animated by that soul. That's a second belief that is reasonable. However, before we get into that, let's look at the opposing argument to see how reasonable it is. Now, what I'm talking about is what the atheist from the chat room I mentioned earlier stated, and that is that our soul just dissipates into the universe after we die, and this is also reasonable. I think he was using reason to rationalize what he doesn't know. And why should we believe in one theory over the other? Either we dissipate into the universe after we die, or we go on to um, go to heaven or hell, because we have an individual soul. It doesn't just become part of a collective. Well, I do choose to believe that I possess an individual soul as opposed to a soul that becomes part of collective energy that fuels the universe or something like that after I die. And um, first of all, the atheist argument is a belief that assumes that God does not exist. If we are to believe that God does not exist, this normally includes the rejection of a soul that goes to heaven or the existence of heaven. No further reasoning or deeper thought is involved in that theory. It is completely devoid of critical thinking. It's based on the assumption that God does not exist. And it leads you to the conclusion that heaven does not exist. So if heaven does not exist, we probably don't have a soul that goes to heaven. Conversely, Reason leads me to conclude that my soul is an individual soul because, after all, I do possess an individual body. And I guess you could say that we're all part of a collective because we all live on the same earth, right? But yet that argument would only go to strengthen the theory of an individual soul. We all have individual souls because we all exist on the same plane of reality individually. That's my argument for an individual soul because we have an individual body. So because we have our life source, the soul, which is absent after death, and each life source is individual during our lifetime, these are great reasons to believe in an individual soul, in my opinion, let's look at the reasonability now of the human soul going on to exist after physical death. The question would then become, where would it then reside, right? And since it is no longer um, exists, it no longer exists in um, a material form, we should have to wonder, does it go on to exist after the body becomes just a heap of atoms? Now, I could reasonably argue that nothing in this reality on Earth ever just disappears, as in nothing would just cease to exist, really. And that's because anything that exists and is made up of matter, cannot reasonably just disappear into thin air and out of existence. I think that's very reasonable to say. And the example that I like to use of this is water. 
Now, before you think that's a joke or something that I made up off the top of my head, let me explain. I'm sure that everyone out there listening knows that we are drinking the same water that the cavemen drink, uh, drank, um, I don't know, 10 to 20,000 years ago, whenever cavemen walked the earth. And it's the same water that the dinosaurs drank before that. The water that covers the earth and the water that we drink nowadays has been around since then. And it has its own system of recycling itself. And that system of recycling has kept it around since, well, probably since it was created. We drink the water, we expel the water from our bodies, and then it goes through a filtration system, otherwise, named, uh, otherwise known as earth. Yes, the rock and the dirt that we walk on filters out all the impurities, then it rises up or evaporates back into the sky and finally comes down as rain. It never just disappears. And this goes for even when we use it for industrial reasons. It sticks around and goes through the process of natural filtration. As a matter of fact, nothing ever just disappears, not just water. Here's another example. Now imagine you take a rock, like the size of your fist or something, and you place the rock on a fresh slab of concrete or on a bigger rock. Then you take a large sledgehammer and you smash it until it becomes dust. Did the rock just disappear and cease to exist? No, the rock still exists, just in a different form, as dust. Another one. A cow is born. As the cow ages, it grazes on grass and other green leafy f foods that, grass, um, that cows eat. And the grass and the food that the cow eats did not just disappear. It still exists, just in a different form as part of the cow. The cow dies. The cow did not just disappear. It still exists, just in a different form. As it becomes part, it be, first becomes a heap of atoms without its animal soul, and then it decomposes and becomes part of the ground. And here's where the cycle starts all over again where grass can grow on that same very ground, that very same ground that the cow became a part of, and now the cow exists as not just part of the ground, but as the grass now. And so on and so forth. Now everything, you can apply that to everything because nothing ever just disappears. So I, I, I'd like to ask everyone out there to think about this. Why should I or anyone out there believe anything different about my individual soul? See, once the soul is created, once a body is given life by God, it's just like anything else. It will not, or better yet, cannot just disappear into nothingness and out of existence. So what I, I want to do is ask everyone out there to do is to use your imaginations and think about something, anything just disappearing into thin air. Ask yourselves, where would it go? I mean, is there a place where things that disappear go? Of course not, right? Sounds ridiculous. Is there a reality which is separate from ours where things that disappear just reappear in that reality? No, nothing just disappears into non-existence. So I could arguably, I'm sorry, I could reasonably conclude that the soul is no different. After the body is dead, the soul goes on to exist, just in a different form. Our life force, the soul, without the now heap of Adam, which was our human body, 
goes on to exist in a different form. And I base this reasoning on what I can observe and learn from in the physical world from all those examples I just gave you. And it's because not unlike all that exists in the physical world, the soul goes on. So I could therefore reasonably conclude that the only difference is, is that since the soul is the spiritual part of the physical world, it goes on to exist in a spiritual form, in a spiritual realm. Which brings me to the next subtopic of tonight's show, the existence of heaven. Now, I decided to research the atheist view of heaven so I could use that research in this part of uh, tonight's presentation. So I looked it up on YouTube, and guess what? I couldn't find a single thing. Now, YouTube is a good um, source of information because people give their actual opinions, and I'm trying to talk about someone's opinion right now. But I did find a lot of atheists talking about their opposition to the existence of hell. I found nothing on um, the existence of heaven. I found discussions on morality and everything in between, but not one video or audio book or anything on their views of heaven. And my theory is that it's because atheists keep everything about religion as negative as they can, as negative as possible. And the belief in heaven is too positive to cast doubt on. So they concentrate their efforts on opposing hell and cast a positive light on how fun sinning could be. I mean, I've seen many dozens, maybe even hundreds of videos on that. So I decided that the best way to show how reasonable it is to believe in heaven is to compare the differences between eternity and the nature of time and space. <laughs> and I say this because our belief in heaven includes the belief that heaven is eternal. No beginning and no end. We also believe that heaven is a spiritual realm, so to speak. And I would rather stay away from the specifics of our belief in heaven because, or the beatific vision, anyway, because that would only serve to confuse the average atheist. There's a lot of believers out there that wouldn't know what the beatific vision um, actually is, our beliefs on the beatific vision. So let's just stick with the basics. How can you have something that has no beginning and no end? It's something that's eternal, like our belief in heaven. Everything must begin, and everything must end. And that's probably the objection that we'll get from atheists. Well, I have to admit that is a good point, because by its very nature, both time and space have a beginning, and must come to an end. Now, I've spoken about this on a couple of other shows, but I'd like to bring up a demonstration of time and space. If you've heard this one before, please bear with me. But anyway, I have to ask everyone out there to use your imagination. Imagine it, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, imagine yourself walking through a room and you walk across from one side of the room to the other. That's a demonstration of time and space. And that's because your walk through the space in the room took you time to do so. Your walk had a beginning, it had a middle, and then it had an end. As you come in through one side of the room, you walk through the room, and then you walk out of the room. Now, that's a demonstration of time and space, and let's talk about eternity now. There is nothing that exists 
within time and space that is eternal. And this means that eternity has no beginning, does not have a middle, and has no end. Now, I should say that man has never found anything in the observable universe that is eternal. So just like your walk through the room had a beginning, a midpoint, and an end, so too does everything in the universe. Everything exists, or everything that exists within the universe exists within time and space. As another example, let's just uh, look at our lives, the life, the lifespan of a human being. We are born, we age, and then we die. That's a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? That is a perfect example of the nature of time and space and the, and the nature of the time and space in the room and the time and space that we take up as we live and we grow as human beings. All earthly space and outer space began at some point in time, and it must, by its very nature, come to an end at some point. Time must obey the same rules, and it's time that demonstrates the rule to, the, to more effect. Try this. If you count the minutes from 1 to 100, you must begin your count you must go through the count, and the count must end. Try counting to one million. I don't think anyone has that kind of time or patience, right? But the same rule applies there no matter how long the count. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, we may call these the rules of time and space, but time and space must abide by those rules. And to say otherwise would be very unreasonable. And I base what I'm saying on what we can observe and learn from in this physical world. So the question then becomes, do, do these rules apply to the entire universe? Well, the universe abides by the rules of time and space, for sure, because everything in the universe is made up of matter. And anything made of matter, takes up space. Therefore, all matter exists within space, time and space. The same rules apply. If we look up into outer space, we can be sure it, takes, it would take us time for us to travel through the space to reach any of those objects that we see in outer space. Therefore, everything that exists within the universe exists within the boundaries of time and space. So then all the objects in outer space had a beginning. We are witnessing their present and they must come to an end. However, I think it's especially important for me to note that I'm not talking about when everything ends and is no more. No more time and space. What I mean to say is there must be an edge to the universe or an outer rim, if you like, kind of like the outer rim of the galaxy that we live in. The galaxy exists within the universe, but there is a time and a space where the galaxy ends. And that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about the universe there is an outer edge of the universe. And that may not sound like a sensible statement for me to make, especially to other Christians. I've heard Christians think that's a ridiculous idea. But when you think about it, the creation story in the Bible speaks of a time when God created all things. So the creation of time and space should be easy for us to understand. As a Christian, I must accept that the universe had a beginning. Therefore, the conclusion I draw as a Christian is that the universe does have an end. Or like I said, there is an edge to the universe. To believe otherwise would be to say that after God created the universe, it became eternal. And there's no end to the universe. That's not the Christian belief. 
the Christian belief includes the belief that the universe is not eternal. In other words, according to everything that we could observe and learn from, the universe is not boundless. I've heard atheists say that the universe is boundless. That's not a Christian belief. And that's been said by atheist scientists as well, Stephen Hawking being one of them. Also, there's nothing within the scientific sphere of knowledge which would provide proof to the contrary that the universe is boundless. Man has never come across anything within the observable universe which would lead us to believe that the universe is infinite. Oh, there's no proof other than our own imagination there is. The time-space continuum. Einstein, in his theory of relativity, called what I'm talking about the time-space continuum. Time and space exist within a continuum and points out the fact that the universe exists within the boundaries of time and space. And this is because it all exists within three dimensions. So, what am I getting at here? Why do I talk so much about time and space and the limits of time and space, the boundaries and the rules of time and space? I bring this up because it begs the question, if time and space have a beginning... What was there before time and space began? Also, if time and space have an end, if the universe has an edge, what is it that exists at the edge of time and space, at the edge of the universe? Now try this. If you look up at, look up at the sky and find the farthest star that you can see, try to imagine what's past that. The farthest star that you can see with the human eye. We could see past that with telescopes. So imagine if you're looking at one of the strongest telescopes that exists on Earth. Find the, fa the farthest star or the farthest galaxy that you can find. Try to imagine what's past that. With the rules of time and space, we know that the universe does not go on forever. So what else could be out there past that farthest star that you could see? A fence? A wall or a borderline? Now that sounds utterly ridiculous, doesn't it? Even more ridiculous. Who would have built the wall or the fence? I mean, you can't think of anything more ridiculous than that, can you? There is nothing or no one that exists that could pull that off, build a big wall or fence around the universe, right? <laughs> I mean, I feel kind of awkward bringing it up anyway. Well, I should correct myself there. There is nothing and no one out there that exists within time and space that could, bring, that could pull that off. I'll u let you use your imaginations on uh, the answer to that, what I just stated. Um, I would have to argue that because of the facts that we've been talking about, the existence of eternity would be absolutely necessary for the existence of time and space. And that is, only with the existence of eternity would time and space even be possible. So just to state it clear, since time and space had a beginning, the existence of eternity must come before the possibility of time and space itself. Now, this seems difficult to imagine, but we must consider the alternative. Time and space began from some spontaneous happening without a cause and from nothing at all. And nothing existed before the creation of the universe, before the creation of time and space. We must consider the nature of time and space to be the surest proof of the existence 
of eternity. There was something before time and space. Time and space are limited to boundaries, whereas eternity is not. Eternity has no beginning, has no middle, has no midpoint, and has no end. So let's go ahead and talk about alternative theories then, just to put it into perspective. There is one which I would call the great void theory. That's just the name I gave to it. And this comes from the atheists who believe that there was nothing before time and space and the universe created itself from it, from nothing. So we could imagine that there was a great big void where time and space now exist. I mean, a void. If so, then where did the void begin and where did it end? What existed at the end of the void? Or was it, was it an infinite void? Void of everything. Void of anything. Absolutely nothing that went on forever. An infinite void which created finite time and space. That's not very reasonable. This seems to be reasoning which is built on assumption, the assumption that God does not exist. Another possibility is the theory that time and space is infinite. Or as some atheists have put it, time and space have no, has no boundaries. According to the nature of both time and space, that theory is not very reasonable either. Both are possible, but not very probable. Either way, we must knowledge, and here's the meat and bones of what I'm trying to say, either way we must acknowledge the existence of eternity, an eternal void, time and space is eternal, or other, some other form of eternity. Either there was an infinite void, time and space is infinite, or we choose to believe that God is eternal. Now for me, the most reasonable choice would be the eternal creator and infinite God, which we Christians believe in and worship. Here is where the reasoning of the two beliefs come together. Now, once created, the soul or the human soul does not ever cease to exist, just like all of our physical examples that we had earlier in the show. Our life force, or our soul, goes on to exist in a different form after a physical death. The soul is the spiritual part of human existence, so it goes on to exist in the spiritual realm. Lastly, heaven is a spiritual place which we cannot see, and the soul is the same. So since time and space are finite, and God is eternal, we can reasonably say that we would spend eternity with God in heaven when that is what we choose to believe. And we believe that because of reasoning or a reasonable faith. And like I said at the top of the show, the average atheist would surely reject this reasoning. Yet it is reasoning nonetheless. Now, don't get me wrong. I do not presume to claim that that goes, or everything that I, I'm talking about goes to prove the existence of heaven and the human soul. All I mean to say with this presentation tonight is that the belief in both heaven and the human soul are reasonable. We use our reasoning, which is contrary to atheist reasoning, by the way. Atheist reasoning begins and ends with the assumption that God does not exist. So we have to choose which of the two to believe or to accept. I choose to believe in divine revelation and reject the assumption that God excuse me, that God and heaven does not exist. 
we must use our God-given human reasoning to conclude that God exists. And further reasoning leads us to the belief in heaven. Now, divine revelation is what I'm talking about here. And just like any other type of knowledge, revelation compounds and has compounded. Revelation knowledge, knowledge that we get from revelation compounds. We learn, and then we learn more, which leads us to more learning and more knowledge. It's kind of like learning how to count before you can add, and then you go on to your multiplication, your times tables, we used to call it, in elementary school, and then we go on to things like uh, algebra and calculus, right? Just like any other type of knowledge, divine revelation compounds in the same way. And that's because age-old revelation has always been based on reasoning that comes from what we can observe and learn from, just like what we've been talking about tonight. This is, of course, contrary to reasoning which is built on assumption. If at the base of atheist beliefs is assumption, the assumption that God does not exist, then it becomes built upon that assumption, kind of like the foundation of their knowledge. Then what they have to do is use their imagination to explain what they believe or what they don't believe. This amounts to nothing less than pseudo-knowledge. It's made up. They use their imaginations to make it up. And that's because just like actual knowledge, pseudo-knowledge also compounds and has compounded. And that's because one assumption leads to another, which would lead to another assumption. If you assume God does not exist, then you have to assume heaven does not exist. You have to assume that the human soul does not exist. But it's all based on assumption. Well, that's all I have time for uh, for this show, and I have to say goodbye to everyone out there listening to WCATradio.com, and I'm looking forward to spending this time with each and every one of you, and I'd like to hear from you as well. Please email me at madrigal.robert at ymail.com and that's spelled M-A-D R-I-G-A-L dot Robert R-O-B-E-R-T your at sign, then just the letter Y, mail.com. And please feel free to send me any questions and more importantly comments. If I've said anything that's in error, let me know about that as well. I'll be the first person to admit when I'm wrong. And I would like to ask everyone out there to pray for all Christians and for Christian unity. Please pray for all atheists as well to come to the understanding of divine revelation and reject knowledge built on assumption. So then, let's go ahead and end the show with a prayer. We'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in great thanksgiving today for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we may learn more about our faith for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity, and to see challenges to our faith as the chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we meet, and to do this through the example of self-sacrifice that Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. We ask this through the glorious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening, and um, I hope you all have a good week until our next show. Take care and God bless. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in 
and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.